So, well, thank you first for uh, welcoming me. Um, I'm happy to uh, be here, although virtually today. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to dis discuss uh, several aspects of um, the concordance model of cosmology and um, testing this model, uh, mostly using uh, the large scale structure. I'm going to be brief here because I think everybody uh, in the group is uh, working on cosmology anyway. Um, but uh, so if you think about the current model of uh, cosmology, we have uh, three main pillars um, that the model is based on. The first pillar is the assumption of uh, isotropy and homogeneity, uh, often called the, uh, the cosmological principle. So if you accept that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, then the only uh, possible metric to describe such a universe is the so-called friedman lemaitre uh, robertson Walker metric, uh, which has this shape. And it has two main um, characteristics, I would say. Um, this uh, k here, the curvature, uh, which is constant and can take uh, three values uh, for a uh, positive, negative, uh, curvature, curvature or a flat universe. And the second um, of these, um, I would say, uh, characteristic of the metric is uh, the presence of this uh, time dependent um, term here, the scale factor, uh, which describes the expansion uh, of the universe. And as I like to say, cosmology is essentially the uh, study of uh, A of T of the scale factor. Um, okay, so the first assumption is, um, is your, um, the metric, and uh, so far we haven't made any assumption regarding uh, the nature of gravity. Maybe we assume that uh, gravity is a, is a, a metric theory, um, but we haven't actually assumed any model for gravity. So uh, the current model is um, general relativity. Uh, once you plug it to your theory, you obtain uh, the Einstein equation, which link together the geometry of space-time and uh, the energy content uh, of the universe, um, and which may or may not include uh, a cosmological constant. So once you have your uh, Einstein equation and uh, you have uh, the shape of your metric, you obtain uh, the Friedman equation, which tells you uh, how the this scale factor evolved and link the evolution of the scale factor to uh, the different components of the universe, namely the matter um, term, the curvature term, and uh, the dark energy term. And the last pillar on which the uh, model is built um, is uh, the initial condition of the universe. And, um, so this arises from um, a few problems in, in cosmology, uh, namely the flatness of the universe. How can we explain uh, that the universe is so flat? Um, and uh, the uh, homogeneity. So this is a map of the uh, CMB. I'm sure everybody knows here. And it's really hard to explain how uh, these regions here and there, which are, um, if you believe that the universe is uh, something like 13.7 billion year old, it's hard to explain that these regions are um, in causal contact. Um, so inflation is um, basically an era of uh, rapid expansion in the past. And that solved all of this problem by um, by um, essentially stretching uh, any curvature and flattening the universe and increasing the horizon such that um, the part that were causally disconnected become now um, connected. Um, and it's also interesting for, for, for uh, structure formation because um, if you assume that you have um, primordial fluctuation, then um, these are stretched to cosmological sizes and um, can become the seed for, uh, for um, structure formation. And um, so the main question regarding uh, inflation, well, first, we don't know um, what kind of inflation uh, it could be. There is uh, billions of uh, theories. And I think some of you are um, trying to constrain those theories. Uh, but the main two main questions is um, are uh, whether or not these uh, fluctuations are Gaussian and whether or not uh, that power spectrum is a uh, scale invariant. Okay, so now we have uh, the three pillars on which the uh, concordance model is built. Now, observationally, this is very well supported um, by uh, different data sets, most notably combination of the uh, cosmic wave uh, background, 
uh, baryon acoustic oscillation or uh, type 1 is supernovae. And uh, we end up with the energy budget of the universe where uh, we essentially don't know 95% uh, of the universe. Right? So ordinary matter only accounts for something like 5%. Um, so first of all, it's not very satisfying to, <laughs> to be there and, um, uh, and basically to be missing 95% of the universe. Uh, and at the same time, as we are getting better data and uh, data of better quality, um, tensions uh, start to arise, um, uh, most notably uh, the Hubble tension, where the value as inferred from the CMB um, is in tension to the something like five sigma level with um, local estimates uh, of the Hubble um, constant. So on one side, we have this theoretical, you know, um, dissatisfaction of uh, only understanding 5% of the uh, universe. And, but on the observational side, we also have um, uh, something that describes very well the universe, but with uh, tensions that are becoming increasingly um, disturbing. So, um, so maybe we can you know, keep pushing and keep uh, measuring the parameters up to the 10th uh, digit or whatever, but maybe we need to take one step back, you know, and try to um, to rethink the theory and um, revisit uh, all those different um, blocks, basically, that uh, upon which the current uh, model uh, is built. And so that will be the the guide of uh, this talk, like how to test uh, the different assumptions that are here. Um, so to do that, uh, I make use of um, a lot of statistical methods, um, and I wanted to describe them a bit, although I think uh, many people in your group will be familiar with them. Um, so when you have a model, um, you can you know, easily, uh, or relatively easily, compare it to the data, and um, you can obtain constraints on, um, on the parameters of this model. Particular, if you use Bayesian inference, you can obtain what you, uh, we call the posterior uh, distribution on the parameters, uh, which gives you the uh, uh, basically an estimation of the uh, of the parameters of the model. Um, but uh, so while these are usually more straightforward and uh, have a strong constraint power, you need to remember that you always have to assume a, mo a model to do that. And um, therefore, uh, your results will always be biased toward the uh, assumed model. And um, another point is uh, that if your model is wrong, then uh, the constraint that you obtain on the parameters are uh, meaningless. So uh, it's important to, in addition to those model dependent methods, to have what we call model independent methods, where um, you don't start from a model, um, but uh, you, so usually they are more um, data driven. Um, and they may be more difficult to, uh, to apply. You may suffer from uh, oversfitting uh, problem, uh, but they, have, they tend to have more flexibility and therefore uh, you may see things uh, in the data that uh, you may not be able to see um, using traditional model dependent approach. Um, and uh, you won't be uh, biased towards a particular model. Um, but um, the price to pay is uh, that they may have less constraining power because of their uh, flex flexibility. So I'm not so here. I'm not saying that we should use uh, one kind instead of the other. I'm just saying that um, both give you different uh, information, and uh, and so we should use uh, both of them essentially. Um, so today I'm going to focus more uh, on uh, this kind of method, which is. Um, arguably less used in the literature, although it's been uh, more and more used in the last uh, few years. Okay, so let me um, start with the linear regime of structure formation. And um, so I will focus on um, a few aspects, in particular, the nature of the uh, metric, whether or not it's consistent with uh, FLRW, whether or not the universe uh, is consistent with a flat uh, universe, and whether or not dark energy uh, is consistent with um, the cosmological concept. Okay, so first of all, where do we start from? Um, what do we observe? One of the first, um, well, historically, the first um, 
uh, observational piece of evidence uh, for uh, the acceleration of the expansion um, and, uh, and the establishment of dark energy as part of the concordance model is uh, the type 1a supernovae. Um, so because we assume that, uh, we think that we know the intrinsic um, luminosity of those uh, exploding stars, um, we think that uh, observing them um, can tell us how far they are essentially. Um, and uh, so what's interesting here is that there is a degeneracy between this intrinsic luminosity and uh, the Hubble constant. So what we actually know is uh, not the absolute distance, but uh, the shape uh, of this distance, but we miss um, some anchor. Um, in addition to that, we also have a baryon acoustic oscillation, um, which is essentially um, the um, fingerprint of uh, the, or the footprint of the um, early universe physics on the distribution of galaxies today. So here again, uh, you need to know the distance, the R, what I call RD here, the uh, south horizon at the uh, drag epoch. And if you know this distance, then you can, um, by measuring the bumps in the correlation function, so this is a, a schematic view here, um, by estimating the bump, uh, you can uh, put constraint on uh, these quantities here. And if you know this, you can uh, measure the, uh, the distances. So those are two of the main uh, distance probes um, that I will be uh, using in this, um, in this part of my talk. Yeah. <clears throat> so let me introduce um, one of the, um, so I'm going to be using several uh, model independent methods. So let me introduce the first one, which is um, the so-called iterative smoothing approach. So the idea is that um, you have data, OK? You start from an initial guess from your data. So in my case, the data will be the, um, these ones here, OK? The, um, uh, so I think this is taken from the Pantheon uh, compilation yeah. um, of uh, supernovae. So you start with uh, this data, and you start with an initial guess, OK? Um, so you subtract them, and you obtain some residual that you convolve uh, with a smoothing kernel. And you obtain um, some smooth function. And you put this smooth function back here, and you subtract the data again, and you reapply the same smoothing kernel. And you reiterate a certain number of times. Now, the thing is you can uh, start with a different initial guess, OK? Or many different initial guesses. And what's interesting is that uh, no matter what initial guess you start with, uh, you always end up with the same final um, reconstruction. Uh, and therefore, it's independent of your initial guess. Okay, so it's something that's only driven by the data, um, and uh, therefore it is model independent. So we end up with a collection of uh, many uh, reconstruction, smooth reconstruction, that all fit the data better than the lambda CDM best fit, and uh, because they are independent of the initial guess, they are model independent. Um, so here. I'm going to um, show so this um, this figure here. I'm showing uh, the different reconstructions. So this is the distance, and this is um, the uh, expansion history. Uh, essentially, this is one of the, the derivatives of this. Um, and uh, so the solid lines here are the um, expansion histories or distances as reconstructed by the supernovae. And uh, on top of that, I'm um, over plotting uh, the BAO point. So this is uh, from uh, BOSS. And uh, I have one point from the uh, DES collaboration also here. Um, and I'm also uh, over plotting the, uh, so that was a paper back in 2018. Uh, so back then it was the Planck uh, 2015 uh, best fits that I'm over plotting in uh, blue here. So a few things to say, first of all. So first of all, I want to insist that uh, the solid reconstruction here are not, um, they are not obtained from uh, the BAO data point, but they are obtained from the supernovae uh, data point that I'm not uh, showing here uh, because there's too many of them. Okay, so uh, the first thing to see is that uh, from low redshift to redshift of about uh, one point something, you have very good agreement 
between all of them, the BAU, the supernovae, and uh, the CMB. And then you start to see at higher redshift, you start to see some deviation. Uh, in particular, you have a preference for the supernovae for um, uh, excess or for higher expansion rate, while uh, BAU tend to prefer a lower um, expansion uh, rate. Um, so on the supernovae side, um, it's relatively easy to understand. Uh, beyond redshift one, you have very few data points, okay? Um, so I wouldn't trust uh, this part. Uh, I wouldn't put, put, put too much trust on this part. It's really, uh, we do lack uh, data at high redshift. Um, but it's interesting to see that uh, nonetheless, that uh, we do have some signs that uh, supernovae prefer this higher expansion rate, while um, BAU have the uh, opposite um, preference. Um, so another, an interesting quantity that you can build and uh, that only depends on this expansion history H here is the so-called uh, ohm parameter. And uh, ohm is defined this way. And um, it has this night property of uh, being constant and equal to uh, the matter uh, density parameter, omega m, if you live in a flat lambda CDM universe. Okay, So ohm is a very nice test of the uh, flat lambda CDM uh, model. Because if you measure ohm that is inconsistent with a, a constant value, then uh, you can essentially rule out lambda CDM. Um, so here, so in blue, again, that's what you uh, expect from Planck. This is, uh, of course, this is the, a uh, Planck lambda CDM, so uh, it's obviously constant. Uh, but if you look again, um, both up to redshift of one or so, uh, BAO supernova, I mean, there is no surprise here. Uh, this is just a recasting of this plot, right? So no, no new information. Um, but it's interesting to see it in terms of this parameter, because you see very good consistency with um, constant ohm up to redshift of one point something. And then you see the same behavior with a sign of departure on the supernovae side and um, um, prefer signs of preference for a low, slightly lower value on the BAU side. Um, so yeah, those data starts to be a bit, uh, a bit old. So I think it's time to update it with uh, more recent um, data, but uh, yeah, still interesting to see what's going on here. Um, in particular, those uh, high redshift uh, signs of tension are not new. Uh, they've been noticed uh, before. Um, so yeah, really looking uh, forward to what the future will tell us about uh, the behavior of uh, high redshift. Um, interesting things that you can do. So um, for instance, um, because the supernovae uh, are independent, uh, both of H0 and on uh, RD, and uh, the BAO do depend on those, uh, this H not RD um, uh, product. If you divide one by the other, you can essentially uh, get rid of the expansion and put constraints on uh, H not RD. So that's what I'm showing here. So in green this time, I'm showing uh, the Planck, um, the Planck uh, constraints, uh, which are here. So I think this is Planck again in 2015. And um, so here in, um, so you can obtain this both at both levels. So at the uh, distance um, level and at the expansion history um, level, okay? So here on the, so what? So the orange one here um, is using this formula, which is the uh, distance as inferred from the supernovae divided by the uh, angular distance of the, uh, from the BAO. And this is fully consistent with um, the Planck uh, measurement. Now, if you look at the uh, blue-ish ones, which are here, again, at up to redshift one, perfectly fine. And as you go towards a higher redshift, you start to see uh, some signs of deviation. So this is uh, essentially because we are using, again, this uh, H, which is the derivative. So you have a higher, um, higher fluctuation in the derivative. And you can see indeed the uh, size of these error bar that's due to the supernovae, uh, that's huge. Uh, so because of the size of the error bar, uh, no, nothing is really um, significant. And I think we are uh, still totally consistent with uh, Planck. Um, 
But nonetheless, that's an interesting uh, model independent measurement uh, of this H not RD product, um, which in particular, in, you know, at this, um, I mean, now it's been a few years that this Humble tension is uh, still here. So uh, I think it's interesting to, uh, to perform those uh, measurements uh, that combine both the um, late and the early years. But you can go even further. Um, and uh, what you can do is uh, testing the, um, the FLRW uh, metric. So that's uh, a few lines of uh, algebra, but basically, um, so you can always, for any value of, uh, of omega, you can always write uh, the, uh, so this is the co-moving distance. You can always write it uh, in this form. And if you calculate uh, the derivative, you obtain uh, this line here. And uh, again, this quantity, okay, um, if you live in a FLRW universe, this quantity should be constant and equal to uh, the curvature uh, parameter. Okay, so what we did, so first of all, you need to notice that here, this is dependent on H naught. Um, and this test was performed about uh, 12 years ago now and with uh, relatively old data. And back then there was no deviation from, uh, from uh, flat FLRW basically. So what we did here is we recasted um, the same is the same um, same quantity, but this time we expressed it in terms of the um, the quantities that we just um, uh, just isolated. And what's interesting is that basically uh, H not R D uh, is completely taking out uh, of this equation. Okay, it's it cancels out uh, through this uh, alcott pashinsky uh, parameter. And um, so we express this quantity in a way that only depends on um, the BAO measurement on one hand and uh, the supernovae measurement on the other hand. Okay, so it only depending on uh, two quantities and we're able to, uh, to test uh, mod in a model independent way, test the um, curvature uh, and the consistency with the FLRW, um, FLRW metric. So as before, um, very consistent uh, up to redshift one. Um, and again, uh, the signs of departure at higher redshift are mostly driven uh, by, um, and we can see it here through the size of the supernovae error bar. Um, but uh, again, because of the size of this error bar, uh, there is no significant um, deviation from uh, a flat uh, FLRW universe. Um, so we wanted to see what was going on with this um, expansion uh, history uh, as uh, inferred from the supernovae, okay? Is it uh, cosmological or uh, is it systematics, essentially? Um, so here is uh, actually, maybe I should have shown that slide earlier, but um, so those are the actual uh, Pantheon data. And this is the result of the smoothing. Okay, so you can see that at high redshift, at low redshift, sorry, because we have so many data, um, there is not much room for deviation. And then, because from redshift one and above, we have very few data, um, that's where um, you start to have uh, this behavior. And so we asked the question whether it's possible to uh, to produce a model um, that would. Uh, that would yield this, this kind of uh, expansion history. And we tried um, some models, for instance, um, something that transitioned from um, uh, W, so equation of state of zero to W set of minus one, or even equation of set of one to minus one. And you can see that even with this extreme model of dark energy, um, all you get uh, is really like a very small uh, deviation compared to, um, the ones that we observe. So it's really hard to explain um, what we observe here uh, by cosmology. So uh, we think that what we're seeing is uh, really just um, uh, either unaccounted for systematics or just dr uh, driven by the uh, small number of, uh, of data. So what we did is um, a um, phenomenological uh, correction of the data. And basically we, um, we shifted all the uh, linearly shifted all the data at uh, redshift higher than one, um, and we um, by doing that we are able to reduce really the uh, the spread uh, compared to this. We get the spread in the expansion history, 
Um, and uh, so as you can see, it uh, is better uh, behaved um, in terms also of uh, ohm, although uh, W does not um, seem to improve much. Um, so this correction, this, um, this uh, totally phenomenological um, correction seems to uh, stabilize uh, the data a little bit, but uh, we found no evidence for uh, it to be statistically significant. Okay. So um, we can't really make the claim that there is um, unaccounted for systematics, um, but just you know, we can't really rule out either uh, of their presence. Um, so either way, that was an interesting, uh, I thought, interesting um, study on the uh, high redshift behavior of the supernovae data. All right, so um, the first part of my talk was dedicated to uh, the linear regime and, uh, and the background. Um, so this, in this part of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on um, the perturbation and uh, the nature of uh, gravity. So for that, I will need um, another piece of data, okay? data that depends on uh, the growth itself. Um, so if you have a perturbation in, um, um, in the density field, so here delta is the over density field uh, with respect to the background uh, density. If you have perturbation, then uh, they will, uh, at the linear regime, they obey this uh, growth equation, um, which depend on the expansion history through uh, this uh, expansion uh, Hubble factor H, and uh, also through uh, the uh, matter parameter. But it also depends uh, on your theory of gravity, OK? So here is uh, where gravity comes into account. If, you have, uh, if you're in general relativity, this quantity here um, is 1. But um, if you have an alternative theory of gravity, it will manifest itself here. So, now you solve uh, your equation and you obtain what uh, we call uh, the growth uh, factor D. And uh, most notably, what we uh, in cosmology, what we use is uh, the growth rate F, which is the log derivative. And it has the interesting property of um, being, uh, for a wide range of uh, models, uh, this being um, behaving like uh, the matter density to some uh, exponent gamma. Um, and in GR, in general relativity, this gamma uh, is uh, almost constant and equal to 0.55. But um, as I was saying, so if you live in a modified gravity universe, um, you will have deviation from uh, GR. And this deviation will manifest itself here uh, in gamma, where gamma uh, in non-GR models, gamma um, is not constant anymore um, and will have different values, but also may be uh, scale dependent, OK? So it may be redshift and or uh, scale dependent. So observationally, what you observe is uh, actually the product f sigma 8, where uh, sigma 8 is the uh, amplitude uh, of those uh, fluctuations. And here, <clears throat> so this is taken from uh, the final uh, EBOS paper. And you have the uh, data point here. And uh, so here, this I think it's not the best fit. It's um, a prediction from uh, Planck, I believe, uh, just to show the, uh, the agreement between uh, the uh, EBOS results and uh, what you expect from uh, lambda CDM. OK, so now you have um, all your uh, settings, and you can play uh, different games. So this you can express this f sigma 8 um, quantity here as a function of uh, your uh, background um, your background uh, quantity and this uh, parameter, uh, gamma and uh, sigma eight, what I call sigma eight zero, which is uh, sigma eight today. And you can go from one to the other, okay? So um, you can, if you have your expansion, you can, well, maybe here, if you have your expansion, you can obtain the growth. And I've played this game um, in those paper. Uh, today I wanted to play the other game, okay? So what happens if you know the growth of structure and what can you tell from uh, about the expansion? What's interesting here is uh, that there is an exact uh, formula, okay, that uh, is due to Starobinsky from uh, 1998, where uh, you can reconstruct um, H of Z, the uh, expansion history, if you know uh, delta, so your um, expansion, so your growth, um, growth history, delta, 
and its derivative, delta prime. And if you know uh, omega matter and uh, sigma eight zero, uh, which are two cosmological parameters. Okay. So what's interesting here is that you don't, again, you don't need to make any assumption about the nature of dark energy. Yeah, this is uh, dark energy coming into account uh, through uh, the growth uh, here. Um, okay, so let's play this game. Okay, so uh, if we are able to reconstruct the growth and its derivative, and then if we know omega matter and uh, and sigma eight, then we can obtain um, the expansion history. So this is uh, essentially the, the flow chart of. Uh, of this, uh, this work. You start from the Ratchet space distortion data and you reconstruct them somehow to obtain a smooth uh, function. Actually, the, I guess the likely, likelihood should be at this level, not here. Um, so you obtain a likelihood to the uh, RSD data. And now uh, from the F sigma 8, smooth S sigma 8 that you reconstruct, you can analytically reconstruct uh, the expansion history and the distance moduli and compare uh, to the supernovae, for instance, and you obtain another uh, likelihood. Okay, so that's the game we played um, in this uh, paper. So, um, and I played different uh, reconstruction game at this level. Okay, so let's start with the first one. It's the so-called um, crossing statistic. So the idea of crossing statistic is uh, to ask the question, how consistent uh, is my model with the data? So what, the way it works is you start with the mean function, which is essentially the model that you want to test. So in our case, uh, the best fit lambda CDM, which I'm showing here in red, okay? So you start with this mean function that you want to test and you uh, deform it by multiplying by some um, hyper functions, okay? So in, in this case, we use the Chebyshev uh, polynomial. And then um, you look at the posterior distribution of the coefficient of the polynomials and uh, you ask the question whether um, the data uh, want deviation from the uh, mean function. Okay, so you can see how, uh, so in red here is the uh, mean function, and then you deform it, and the deform um, growth will yield a different deform uh, expansion history and a deform um, distance moduli. Okay, so some of them uh, will fit the data better uh, than others. So you can get a posterior distribution on the um, CIs. Okay, so I played this game. So here I'm only going up to the uh, first order, but you can play the game uh, up to any order that you want and um, obtain constraints on, uh, so posterior on omega matter and uh, sigma eight and on the two uh, hyperparameters here. Okay, so first of all, what do we notice? This is C0, okay? So C0 equal one means, um, no deviation at the uh, at the zeroth order, and C one equal zero means no deviation uh, at the first order. Okay, so first of all, we are totally um, consistent with C zero equal one and C one equal zero. Okay, so that does tell us that the data are totally fine um, with lambda CDM and GR. Okay, so what I call lambda CDM plus GR is uh, expansion that be behaves like lambda CDM and gravity that behaves like uh, GR. Okay, so we are totally consistent. Although because we gave uh, more flexibility to the growth, um, so we have more flexibility um, and this flexibility is transferred to the dark energy term. Um, so, so because we have this extra flexibility, we have wider contour on the cosmological parameters, okay? And we have a preference uh, for higher value of uh, omega matter and a lower value of, um, of sigma eight, but we are again totally consistent with uh, lambda CDM. Okay, so let's <clears throat> let's go a bit further. Um, and here I'm going to use a different uh, reconstruction algorithm, um, Gaussian process. Uh, probably many of you also are familiar with this one. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, popular uh, modern dependent algorithm in cosmology. Um, so here I'm again using GP to uh, reconstruct uh, a smooth uh, F sigma eight. So the the idea behind GP is that uh, essentially, if you have data point and if you have a smooth uh, function, um, the data and the smooth function, um, any collection of uh, points will be joint, jointly Gaussian um, and uh, with a certain input covariance. Um, so you have a certain freedom in choosing the uh, covariance kernel. 
and you can train uh, the parameters on, of this covariance kernel, the so-called hyperparameters, uh, on the data. I'm not going to uh, enter the details of uh, GP, but uh, if you're interested, we can discuss that uh, later. Um, but so the idea again is uh, you need an in Gaussian process. Um, you do need a, a mean function. So many people, when they use GP, uh, they just ignore it and use zero as a mean function. Here, what we are doing is slightly different. So we, we start from, again, um, so we have this, um, we use the best fit lambda CDM as a benchmark, essentially. And we want to go beyond that. So we are using this best fit lambda CDM as a mean function. And then a little bit like uh, the game we played before, uh, by using GP around this mean function, we are deforming this mean function and seeing how these deformation um, improve the fit to the data. Okay, so those are, uh, th this is the fit uh, to, uh, or this is my mean function and uh, the color line are the deformation to this mean function. And then um, you apply the Starodinsky um, formula to reconstruct the expansion history. And then um, from the expansion history, you can obtain uh, the uh, distance linear. So what's interesting, again, I mentioned earlier is that, um, is that you have no, because you have no, uh, assumption as to the nature of dark energy. In particular, there is no guarantee that uh, the dark energy density is uh, positive. Okay, And in fact, if you have high enough value of uh, omega matter, um, this quantity may very well uh, be negative. So here we separated um, the reconstruction into different cases uh, regarding the sign, um, depending on the sign of dark energy. So case A in blue, uh, so blue is mostly in the background, uh, hidden by the uh, green and purple one. Um, but um, the blue ones are the one where uh, dark energy is positive all the way. And then um, in the green and uh, purple case, we allow dark energy to cross zero at after redshift one and after redshift uh, 0.7, uh, respectively. And um, so here is the uh, dark energy energy density. And so in lambda CDM, you will have something uh, like this, okay, that, uh, that's decreasing and becoming uh, zero. But you can see that uh, some of these reconstruction uh, cross, actually cross zero and become uh, positive again. Um, and now you can, because you put constraint on, um, at the same time on the uh, parameters, cosmological parameters, omega matter and uh, sigma eight, you can ask the question, what are the combination of, um, or well, you can ask the question differently. So case A, for instance, case A is the case where uh, dark energy is positive all the way. And you have this whole uh, degeneracy between uh, omega matter and uh, sigma eight. What's interesting now is when you allow um, dark energy to cross uh, zero. So for instance, let's focus on this case here. So cross dark energy is positive up to, uh, let's say 0.7, but is allowed to cross uh, zero after 0.7. And then clearly, if you want to uh, be in this case, then you need to have, as I explained earlier, you need to have a high value of uh, omega matter, um, as well as because of the degeneracy between omega matter and uh, sigma eight, as well as a, a very low value for, uh, for uh, sigma eight, okay? So what's interesting here, the takeaway is that if you're having a uh, model independent approach, um, because of the extra flexibility that you have uh, in both your expansion and your growth histories, you can have non-standard uh, value, for instance, um, higher value of omega matter and lower value of sigma eight together with uh, negative dark energy. So all those things um, do give a better fit to the data than uh, the best fit lambda CDM model. And so we were interested in uh, this negative uh, dark energy density. So we came up with this um, uh, toy model Okay, with a negative cosmological constant. Um, and of course, negative cosmological constant cannot accelerate uh, your universe. Um, so what we do here is we hide it be behind a, uh, a phantom dark energy field, okay? So essentially what we're doing here is adding degrees of freedom. Um, so we have two fields, uh, a phantom uh, X field and a cosmological, uh, negative cosmological uh, constant. And so here is the posterior on uh, the Hubble parameter H. Okay, so this is the lambda, so Planck essentially, the lambda CDM um, case. And if you had, if you just add phantom dark energy, 
because um, you're allowing um, basically higher expansion histories, um, you can, and you're also increasing your number of degrees of freedom. You both you widen your um, your posterior, but you also uh, move your uh, central value. But now, when you add also this uh, negative lambda, well, again you're um, you're adding degrees of freedom, so you're um, uh, you're widening your uh, widening your, uh, sorry, your distribution. But uh, again, your, uh, your central value uh, is uh, also higher. Of course, this is not enough to uh, solve the Hubble tension. Uh, and if it were, you know, the problem would, be solved, uh, would have been solved a long time ago. So that's not what I'm trying to uh, say here. Uh, here, again, I'm just trying to see that it's interesting uh, that uh, this kind of model is consistent with the data. In fact, we compare, we compare the uh, Bayesian evidence and they have similar um, Bayesian evidence, although a uh, larger number of uh, um, parameters. Okay, So even though you have more parameters, um, you still have similar um, Bayesian evidence. So you can't really you know, um, favor uh, this negative lambda over uh, lambda CDM, but you can't either uh, reject it. Um, so it's interesting that such a model is uh, allowed by the data. And on the, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> On the theory side, um, you have um, interesting behavior. So this is the energy of, uh, sorry, the equation of state of your uh, phantom X field. And this is the value of your um, negative uh, lambda. And according to where you are in this plane, um, you have, uh, you may or may not have a transient acceleration um, in the past, okay? So uh, for uh, ne very negative values of uh, lambda and uh, these, uh, yeah, relatively high values of um, equation of states, you have this acceleration, but when you go beyond this uh, uh, further in this zone, then you have no uh, acceleration in the past. So those are interesting. Um, and, and here again, uh, transient acceleration arise again in this zone. Yeah. So this is interesting, uh, an interesting property that uh, arise from these uh, two field model. Um, okay, I should probably speed up. Um, I wanted to say still a few words about uh, what happens in the nonlinear regime. Up till now, I was mostly in the linear regime. Um, so uh, probably happen to have to skip this one. But um, with um, Fabio Dassani and collaborators, um, we, we use the uh, k-evolution code, which is a full GR um, n-body code. Um, but uh, aim to model uh, KSN. So I was not too much uh, interested in this KSN model by itself. I was more interested in seeing the effect of both the combined effect of, uh, of having non-lambda dark energy and together with the uh, nonlinear uh, evolution. And so just briefly, this is uh, a way to measure the deviation. Okay, this is mu, so the effective um, uh, Newton's constant. And this should be constant and equal to one. And uh, we can measure um, how this will be uh, modified by both the nonlinearity and the presence of uh, this uh, non lambda dark energy. And uh, the last chapter I wanted to touch upon was uh, the nature of inflation. I know some of you are interested in it. Um, so, probably don't need to say more, much here. But um, so, one thing that we need to remember um, about the uh, Planck constraints, uh, okay, they are you know great, um, and they do fit the data really well. But we need to remember that uh, we always assume here uh, that the um, the fluctuation are uh, a power law. Okay, so um, what happens if you lift this assumption? In particular, it's interesting um, if you look at the data. So this is the residual with respect to the um, to the best fit uh, power law. And you see some um, behavior uh, at low L. What's interesting is that um, there are non-parallel models that can fit the data uh, relatively well. So this is an example, uh, so-called wiggly with inflation. In a nutshell, it's just um, a model with a, a sharp transition in the uh, potential. And this sharp transition reflects itself by uh, the presence of those uh, oscillations. And those oscillations allow to fit the data uh, better than uh, uh, a power law, of course, at the expense, as usual, at, uh, at the expense of extra degrees of freedom. 
So the idea here is that, okay, we are probably reaching the exhaustion of the CMB data because the CMB by nature is uh, two dimensional now. So the idea here is, uh, can we use the large scale structure to uh, break this um, degeneracy between uh, the different um, models of, uh, or different paradigm of, uh, of the early universe? So to do that, um, what I did was uh, running a series of uh, end body simulations uh, with different uh, initial power low, uh, sorry, initial power spectrum. So both uh, power low, uh, so the red and blue one here are uh, power low best fit to the Planck 15 data, um, two different uh, data set and um, wiggly, um, those wiggly models uh, in those three colors. Okay, so this is the uh, linear power spectrum, um, which I give as an initial condition to my um, n body sims. I run my n body sim, I measure uh, the power spectrum. And so clearly we can, um, we can distinguish, uh, you know, like the blue and green models. Okay, so blue, blue is, uh, the, is a power low model a fit to a, that includes the HFI data from Planck. And uh, D is WID is one of the uh, wiggly width uh, models. But if you look at the other three, it's really hard to uh, distinguish them just by uh, the power spectrum. Okay? And um, so one of the reasons for that is that uh, the power spectrum, um, essentially you reduce the information uh, from three to one dimension uh, by averaging over uh, all the direction. So what we did here is go uh, one step backward, okay? And instead of calculating the, um, the, um, the power spectrum, uh, just do essentially a histogram, okay? How much, um, or count the number of particles. So measure the uh, density in, in, in a grid, on a grid, and uh, plot a histogram. That's what I'm doing here. So this contains a lot of information. Okay, this is uh, the initial condition at redshift uh, 49. This is redshift 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and redshift zero. And this is different resolution. I calculate my um, density field on the grid. Okay, and my grid can have different resolution. So let's focus on this one, which is the highest resolution grid. Okay, this is initial condition, redshift 0.7. And you can see at redshift 0.7, uh, clearly I can distinguish between the um, all the families of model, okay? So I have for each model, I have five models. For each model, I have um, 15 simulations. So I have a total of 75 simulations. And clearly I can uh, distinguish all the um, seven, or not, or not all the 75 simulations, but I can distinguish uh, between the five uh, series of uh, models. But as we go toward lower and lower redshift, uh, these, um, you know, this distinction between uh, different models become harder and harder. So one caveat is that uh, this is done at the matter level, but matter is not what we observe. What we observe is galaxies. So, um, so before doing galaxies, let's study halos. How, the, how well does this hold for halos? And uh, well, then it's immediately uh, much messier. Um, so again, this is redshift, uh, redshift 0.7. Okay, I don't have halos at uh, the initial uh, redshift. So 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.3, and uh, redshift zero. So the situation at redshift 0.7, you can still distinguish, okay, between the uh, one, two, three, four, and uh, five uh, models. But as you go towards lower and lower redshift, they become undistinguishable um, again, okay? All right, so let me uh, summarize. Um, so I perform a series of tests on the, uh, the con concordance model of cosmology, namely checking different assumptions, the nature um, of the metric, the flatness of the universe, the nature of dark energy, the na nature of uh, gravity. So far, we're, we found no inconsistency with uh, the concordance model, although uh, because we're using model independent approach and we have more flexibility, we do have room for uh, deviation from, uh, from the model. Um, I've touched also upon the modeling of the nonlinear regime using uh, n body simulation beyond lambda CDM. Okay? Um, so, in particular, um, I thought that was an interesting one uh, relativistic simulation, um, in particular of a non lambda um, dark energy. What are the effects, combined effects of uh, the nonlinearities and the nature of uh, dark energy? And how does that deviate from uh, lambda CDM? 
And uh, I want to go also to uh, emphasize how um, the use of the large scale structure combined with uh, the CMB can help constraining between um, different uh, early universe uh, models. And that's in particular due to the three dimensional nature of the information. So yeah, looking forward to future uh, surveys, um, both for higher redshift um, to study the higher redshift uh, universe and see what's going on with uh, the, you know, the small deviation that we, uh, the hints of deviation we found here, uh, but also for uh, actually applying to uh, the data here. So yeah, let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Kansan Nida.